Fabian of the Yard. Stories of the war against crime as told by the detective of the century, ex-superintendent Robert Fabian. Here is another factual crime detection story drawn from the personal records of ex-detective Superintendent Fabian of Scotland Yard. Although, like most policemen and ex-policemen, I believe that crime does not really pay over a lifetime. The basis for this belief is largely my knowledge of just how efficient the police machine can be in tracking criminals. Unfortunately, it is almost invariably only in fiction that fate ever steps in to deal out poetic justice to criminals. I say almost invariably because there are one or two examples of poetic justice even within my own experience. They're all the more outstanding because there are so few of them. And probably the most fantastic of all is the strange story of a man who managed to steal 25,000 pounds and smuggle himself across the channel without leaving any trace or clue by which we could hope to catch up with him. You will hear this story in a moment and about the payoff fate arranged for Coco Marquis. Everybody liked young Mr. Marquis. He had a pleasant, easy manner and a twinkling eye. And in three hard-working years, he'd moved his company, British Cocoa Pools Limited, from a back room into a suite of prosperous West End offices with nearly £50,000 capital. He worked hard and played hard, always lavish with money. It was whilst dining one night at Crystal's that Mr. Fabian first noticed him. Yeah, how was the wine, Mr. Fabian? Oh, excellent, thank you, Marcel. Near enough to perfect. Uh, by the way, tell me something. Sir? Who's that fair-haired young ass over there with all that easy money? Uh, where, sir? Oh, oh, I see. Oh, Inspector, are you thinking of making an arrest, huh? Oh, just curious, Marcel. Who is he? Uh, that is Mr. Marquis, uh, Mr. Arthur Marquis. Marquis? What's he do? Oh, he runs British Cocoa Pools Limited. And don't look at me like that, Inspector. I tell you, you may save your time. Since two years now, I invest my savings in cocoa pools and always I get the dividend. That sounds very interesting. How does it work? Oh, you buy a unit certificate for 20 pounds. And with all the money, Mr. Marquis makes big purchases of cocoa at a discount. Then he sells the cocoa and makes a profit. And with the profit, he pays the dividend to the certificate holders. What sort of a dividend do you get? Oh, every three months I have been getting three pounds for each certificate I hold. Three pounds? That's twelve pounds a year for each twenty pounds you invest. Yes, that is correct. A dividend of sixty percent. <laughs> First time I've ever heard of anything like that. It's fabulous. It was that 60% dividend that intrigued Inspector Fabian and led him to make a phone call the next day from his office. Hello? Is that you, Jack? It's Bob Fabian here. How are you? How's the cocoa market these days? That's good. Well, you needn't complain. You're still in business, aren't you? <laughs> well, listen, Jack. I don't know much about your trade, but there's, uh, there's something I'd like you to tell me. Assuming a cocoa buyer is particularly smart and has all the luck in the world, could he pay 60% dividend and himself live like a Raja? Well, don't explode, old man. I take it you've never heard of anyone being able to do that. <laughs> oh, no, nothing special. Just a point I was checking on. Well, thanks very much, Jack. Come on. That phone call, following on the information Marcel, the waiter, had given him, convinced Fabian that there was something very fishy about British Cocoa Pools Limited and Mr. Arthur Marquis. However, in matters of this kind, the police are not expected, and in fact not even permitted to take any action, until they receive a complaint. And as all the investors in the company seemed perfectly satisfied, there was nothing to be done. A few months went by, and then in the autumn of 1936... The bright, popular young director of British Cocoa Pools Limited sailed for a holiday in Paris. He didn't return. 
Mr. Marquis got away with £25,000, and the police discovered he'd never bought cocoa shipments at all, dividends being paid from investors' own money. Radio messages were dispatched to Continental Police, but too late. The astute young fellow had slipped into Spain, and in Spain that February of 1937, there wasn't much the police could do. Franco's troops were storming Madrid. And then, two years later, on a windy April morning of 1939, a phone rang in Vine Street CID office. Inspector Fabian. Hello, Inspector. New Haven Police here. Uh, We have a man in custody, a stowaway on a boat from Spain. Oh, yes? What's his name? He gives it as Arthur Marquis. Does that mean anything to you? My word, it does. I'll come right down. Well, where's the golden boy? Golden boy? You can't mean Arthur Marquis, surely. I don't envy your job of taking him back to London. A little cold doubt swept over Fabian. The description didn't sound like the man he was after. The New Haven inspector led the way to the cells and unlocked one of them. Inside was a man wearing dilapidated trousers and a filthy grey jersey from which his shriveled neck stuck out like that of a tortoise. His hair was tangled, grey and lifeless as cellar cobwebs. His eyes beneath which sagged resinous lids were crisscrossed by ruptured veins. Good Lord. You sure this is the man? Quite sure. Arthur Marquis. He stowed away on a ship from Santander. But how on earth did he get like this? How do you mean? Wasn't he always like this? No. Oh. Look, there's a photo of him taken three years ago. Great Scott! Yes, it's the same chap, all right, but what a change. I'm hanged if I know what happened to him. He won't give us any information except his name. Well, anyway, we'd better try to clean him up a bit. Hello, what's happened to his fingers? Good Lord. The ends of them look like blobs of sealing wax. Marquis, what happened to your fingers? Hmm? My fingers? I lifted my nails out with a knife blade. <laughs> Grimly, the detectives cleaned the repulsive creature as best they could, and Fabian took him back to London after giving him a meal of sandwiches and light ale, which he consumed ravenously. Back at Vine Street, Fabian stripped him and searched his repulsive clothing as is customary with detained persons from abroad. In the folded sleeve of the filthy jersey, the inspector found two tiny objects. They were bits of rice paper, folded as small as aspirin tablets, and secured to the will with crisscross stitches. As the detective began to unfold the bits of paper, the prisoner for the first time showed interest in the proceedings. Be careful with those. Here, give them to me. They're mine. Watch yourself, Marquis, unless you want to be handcuffed. You see, my cellmate wrote those letters the morning before they shot him. I promised if I ever got free, I'd post them. Silently, Fabian unfolded the letters. They were very similar and written in Spanish. One was to the dead youth's mother, the other to his sweetheart. My dear, if this letter reaches you, it will be because I shall never have the joy of seeing you again. I've lived these past three years with that hope to divide my life to your happiness, but God's will be done. Let my memory serve you as an incentive to live and be happy. Be assured that I have loved you dearly. I have prepared myself to die as a Christian. So you see what a lot I shall owe to you. For in this, your love guided me. Where did you get these letters, Marcus? Post them for me, and I'll tell you. I'd have posted them anyway, as soon as I was sure they were genuine. Here, have a cigarette. And then Marquis began to talk. The tale he told was one calculated to curdle the blood of even hard-bitten policemen. He had slipped into Spain, as Fabian knew, and had planned to drift towards Lisbon and get a ship to New York. 
But in Madrid, some partisans had accused him of being a Franco spy. He was beaten senseless and robbed. He awoke among blitz rubble to find he was utterly naked, bruised and gashed, and his nose crushed into his cheeks. The British legation found clothes for him, but the thieves who had robbed him had been to his hotel room in the meantime and taken everything. Marquis knew he must get away from Madrid before the British legation discovered too much about him. He got out of Madrid and managed to get a job cleaning out a stockyard. A patrol of Franco's men raided the farm and took him prisoner. Later, they themselves were captured by Republican forces. Each side tortured Marquis a little to discover if he knew any more, and then lost interest. He became one of the forgotten men in various prisons. By the time Franco had won the Civil War, nobody could remember much about the Marquis. To release him would have given him official status. So they merely withdrew his guard and let him escape. He begged his way to Santander and stowed aboard a ship to England. The wheel had turned full circle. And here is Mr. Fabian's footnote. If somebody knows of a more poetic justice than that which fate meted out to Arthur Marquis, I should be interested to hear it. Needless to say, we were all shocked by his story, but none of us felt like wasting much sympathy on him. Although he'd been submitted to most ghastly physical ill treatment, one wonders if his suffering could really counterbalance that of his victims. Mostly people like old Marcel with a few hundred pounds life savings to invest. The story is completed by the sentence of three years' penal servitude passed on Marquis at the Old Bailey. But personally, I couldn't quite help feeling that after what he'd gone through, the jail sentence was something of an anticlimax. Next week, I will deal with a particularly tragic type of murder case. It is the case of the Black Butterfly. (laughs) 